All right, well, let's get started. Um, welcome to the Topos Institute Colloquium. Today we have Chad Justy talking to us about, uh, well, title is Towards a Useful Category for Persistent Homology. Please, Chad. Well, uh, thank you, David, and, and thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. So um, due to a little logistical mishap, uh, I do not have the, the laptop on which my slides, for some reason, solely live in spite of our cloud-connected era. Uh, so, uh, I've sort of hacked together, uh, uh, this is going to be more of a handwritten, uh, thing that I'm going to uh, think of it as a chalk talk, uh, or a whiteboard talk, but, uh, done remotely, uh, which I will be, uh, wandering through. As a result, uh, I would very much like it if people would jump in and ask questions, um, as we go, feel free to just derail things if you have questions that you want answered because, um, you know, I don't have... 500 pretty pictures to show you today. Um, I'm going to be sort of sketching my way through some big ideas and trying to give you a feel for uh, a big problem that we're currently trying to address in applied topology. Um, but uh, please just jump in, either unmute yourself. I've got the chat window up here so I can see it. So more than happy to answer any questions as we go. Um, and I should also, before I get started, say that, uh, you know, I have Collaborators listed here, Iris Yoon, Rob Greist, Nico Schoenschek, uh, Greg Henselman, Petr uh, Petrusek, uh, Lori Ziegelmeyer. Um, and, you know, if I were being fair, there would be a lot more people um, listed on this slide. Um, these ideas uh, really can't exist in a vacuum. There's a lot of things going on here. Um, and I'm very lucky to have just a really fantastic group of people to talk to about uh about the problems that we're interested in solving. So, um, but please jump in with questions at any point. I'm gonna start uh, with a bit of background because I know that not everybody uh, uh, around here is an algebraic topologist, which, you know, it sort of blows my mind that we can have category theory without an algebraic topology background nowadays. Uh, that seems, seems sort of shocking to me, but also I wanna take an opportunity to just sort of give you my personal perspective on on what the 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 progress has been towards applications here um so right, algebraic topology is a 20th century area of mathematics and and some of you may be deeply familiar with it but um you know roughly what we have is, is some notion of a shape right Oop, that's the wrong pen sorry some notion of something like a shape, right? And it's fancy, it's got some holes in it. Um, and I wanna understand this shape. And when I say understand, what I mean really secretly in my head is differentiate it from other shapes. Um, I, you know, I wanna understand the, the the properties of the shape sort of qualitatively that the way I've drawn it, it's got these two little holes in it and it's got some wiggles, right? There's some geometry there. Um, but but my goal is if someone else comes along and gives me some other shape that they have found lying on the street and they say, are these two really secretly the same shape? Uh, you know, maybe this one got run over by a car or something, but it's still basically the same. Are they are they the same? Um, and it turns out that this answering this question directly um, can be very, very difficult because you have to tell me how to specify a shape. Right? You have to tell me what you mean when you say this word shape. You have to tell me what you mean by the same. Uh, and then you have to be able to test all possible ways that two things could be the same. And this is just a, a bear of a problem. Uh, it it, it re re relies on the fact that our notion of shape as, as humans and then the mathematical formalisms that we build for it are sort of, they're, they're a little bit squishy. There's there's room for interpretation and different ways to describe the same thing. Um, and so what people started doing in the 20th century uh, was building these machines. Um, these, these machines, that, what they would do, uh, you're all very familiar with these machines, uh, even if you're not familiar with algebraic topology because they turn out to be functors. Um, but right, they take us from these this category of these floppy, shape-like objects over to things like groups or rings or you know fields or other various algebraic things right so we have functors um and once we're over on the right then are these two things the same 
uh, if we built our functor properly, it becomes a question of are the are the appropriate algebraic object isomorphic? And somehow this is an easier question, at least from 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 some perspective. It's it's it feels more approachable than the 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 much floppier question of could I stretch this shape in some way to make it into this other shape? And and you know if you ever poke around on YouTube and look at videos of sphere reversions and and all these various other things that you can do with shapes to to continuously deform them so they look like you know they, they look very very different. Um, you sort of you know, get a feel for the fact that that the the shape side is hard and and the the algebra side is still very hard, but it's at least tractable in many cases. Um, so we assign to each shape an algebraic gadget, and then we check to see if the algebraic gadgets are the same algebraic gadget, and this lets us say with some certainty that the shapes are not the same. So these are called invariants. If I give you two shapes that are the same, they must give you the same object. Okay. Um, now, these aren't going to be faithful. There's some notion of, of of collapse of information when we move from left to right, because in any data setting, whenever you gain information by simplifying the picture, you've probably projected away some of the possibilities. So certain things that weren't actually the same under my notion of similarity are going to give me the same algebraic object. Um, you know, the usual usual story. But but this is this is the game. In, in early algebraic topology, right? I want to I want to study shape by by giving it, associating it to its some sort of algebraic object. Well, um, I mentioned that these things are functors, right? So what we'll do is we'll compute things, for example, like homology. This is the big one in what we'll be talking about today, uh, and I can't spell it. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to assign we're going to assign uh, sort of a, a, a free module or a vector space uh, to a to to a uh, to a shape um, where uh, basis elements uh, with with uh, basis given by uh, elements of a triangulation. So I'm going to take my fancy shape that I'm interested in studying, and I'm going to triangulate it. And I can't always get away with this, but usually I can. All right. So now, instead of having the original space, now what I've got is a vector space, and the basis on this vector space are the, the components of my triangulation, the triangles, the edges, the vertices. If it's a higher dimensional object, I'll need tetrahedra, things like this. So this is um, this, this triangulation is what's known as a simplicial complex structure. And let me just again say, if anybody has questions, um, if I've lost you or anything like that, please stop me cold, because uh, I know there's a mixed background in here. No reason anybody should be lost. OK, so I'm going to assign a vector space structure to this shape. And then I'm going. what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to um, consider a sort of notion of independence of vectors, which is not the natural one, which is just the basis that I've given you. But I'm going to instead say, that uh, a collection of vectors are dependent if they form a closed shell, if there's if there's sort of their boundaries all cancel out. So we're going to we're going to find a subspace, um, which is just the the cycles uh, consisting of um, vectors now, that is, families of triangles or simplices um, whose boundaries cancel. And what do I mean by cancel? I mean, if I add, if I take this triangle and this triangle and I add them up, then I look at the boundary 
I've got two copies of that edge that, that sits between them. And I'm going to zero that thing out, right? If I, if I take the right signs of those, right, if I get the basis vectors correspond to those triangles, if I take plus one and minus the other one, and I look at that, that, that edge, the edge is going to zero, it, it'll, it'll zero out when I sum up the boundaries. So if I can construct a collection of these things, which forms a closed shell, then everywhere I'll sort of have pairwise cancellation and I'll get a, a boundary, which is zero. So the, we'll call these things cycles. Um, now, I want to also add a notion of equivalence. And, and this here's just like the simplest possible picture. So imagine this is my shape now. It's this little house-shaped thing. It's, it's, a, it's, it's mostly a graph, right? It's got these vertices or, uh, and, 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 and edges, and then it's got this, this filled-in triangle over here. Um, and yeah, I can see, well, okay, so for example, if I take the sum of this edge A, B, C, and D, a plus B plus C plus D has as its boundary all of these points, but each one appears with parity too. So if I add them up with the right signs, they're going to cancel out. So um, so that's a perfectly good cycle. And it's just a it's a circuit in the graph, which is you know, something where hopefully people have seen. Um, there's another circuit in this graph which goes around the edge of that triangle. Um, but if I look at this object, um, I, and I, I want to think geometrically. All right, I was talking earlier, there are holes in my spaces. I just want to count the holes in this object. Visually, there's one, but, but here I've given you two circuits. Um, what I want to do is note that the reason that I think there's one is because I have this filled in triangle. Uh, so I'm going to set the boundary of that triangle equal to zero. Uh, and if I do that, then that means that this edge C is equal to the sum of D and E, right? So C plus D plus E equals zero tells me that C is you know, minus D minus E. So, um, so I'm gonna set the, these boundaries to zero. Um, this is uh, a subspace of the space of cycles, right? The boundary of something is closed. Uh, David, right, Chad, it looks like there's um, a bunch of two, D, uh, two Ds and then a multiplying by D. And I think I... Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, that's, that's I apologize. this is the problem with trying to do this. Yes. I hand so very quickly. There's also two Ds in the figure, just to let you know. Oh, great. Oh, I've just gotten gotten out of hand. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry, folks, about the, uh, the lettering. Um, let me get rid of this one entirely. We'll call this partial, which looks like a D, but is secretly a different LaTeX symbol. So mathematicians like to, to get away with it. Well, it's partial for boundary. Um, you think about it as a derivative and there's a reason why you would want to do that. Uh, and I'll call this one, so this will still be D, this will be E and this will be F. Did I get it right that time? Okay, so now C uh, plus E plus F will be zero. So C is minus E minus F. So I can think about going Right, so th uh, this is an equivalence relation on sets of edges, that is on 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 uh, vectors in my in my uh, space uh, in this vector space I've constructed, and in particular, this uh, these things bound these boundaries of closed objects are themselves cycles necessarily, right? If I go around a closed object, I'm gonna I'm gonna close it off. I'll get a cycle. So this is a subspace of the space of cycles. And homology is essentially the following. I take, so I write HK, which is the kth homology, is uh, of my particular, you know, X, whatever, this is my simplicial complex X, is defined to be uh, the cycles formed from k simplices, that is simplices with k plus one vertices, right? K-dimensional. I apologize. Uh, everyone, is, is there anyone who is uncomfortable with the notion of a simplicial complex? I know that's uh, sort of a, it's, it shows up all over mathematics, but sometimes I walk into a room and no one's ever seen one. So uh, just wanna make sure that we're all okay. Okay, no hands, great. So cycles from k simplices, 
modulo the boundaries of k plus one simplices. Okay, and that's that's going to be so I've taken this vector space made up of these cycles. This is just subspace of my original space, and now I'm going to set some subspace equal to zero. So if so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop seeing the difference between C or minus E and minus F. Okay. So this is um, this is our object, and and sort of one of the the miracles, one of the very first things that you you discover in a course on algebraic topology in the modern world, and one of the absolutely most useful facts in all of algebraic topology is that if there is a map, if we have a map, and I'm just gonna say a morphism of simplicial complexes and leave that undefined unless somebody really presses me for it. Uh, F taking X to Y, we, uh, we get a map uh, F star, which takes HK of X to HK of Y. All right, and, and this, and you get everything that you want. It is a functor. All right, and so this is you know, one of the very, very early examples of functors as we found them in sort of the, the mathematical world. Um, so why do I care about the fact that this is that this happens? Because now I can do a much finer thing than just saying, are these two groups isomorphic? I could say something specific. I can say that this group is is actually under some some map, under some geometric interpretation this subgroup, right? I can I can essentially test. I can say I have, you know, my, my shape and it's got some holes in it. And now I've got, you know, some cycle that I've found with homology. So it's this sort of thick line here that I'm filling in, right? And, and so this thing here is some element in homology in, in, in my space. Right, it's, it's some 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 equivalence. You know, there's there's some equivalence classes here, but I'm I'm just there's a representative that looks like this thing, and it's ringed around this uh, this 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 hole. Um, if you want to if if you want to understand who right, up, up to isomorphism, there are sort of two different holes. So I should expect something like you know two different. Uh, Two different uh, potential places where I could string this uh, string this loop, and not be able to deform it uh, without sort of tearing it across the hole. Um, so if I want to see which one of these two I happen to have my hands on when I'm holding a particular element of a vector space, I can build a test function that that takes a circle, an abstract circle that I own that I built, and drops it into the space in the place where I want it to go. And then I can say, where does the homology of this thing, where does the sort of very simple homology of my test space land under this map that I've carefully geometrically designed in the vector space that you've computed using your triangulation of my space, right? So this lets me identify elements of the homology of the space based on geometric structures that I can test for, that I can, I can build uh, 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 sort of identification maps for. You think of it like in physics, like a test particle. You send a test particle through your system and see where it goes. Here, I'm sending a test circle into my topological space somewhere that I, you know, I'm gonna carefully place it in, in a particular starting location and I'm gonna see where in the, in the algebra side we land. Okay. So this is this is useful if I want to reason about the geometry, um, and there's a tremendous amount of work in algebraic topology where people essentially do this. They say, okay, I understand this space and I understand how it fits in that space, so now I can understand something about the structure of the algebra in, on the other side. Okay, so this is how traditionally we've used um, how traditionally we've used uh, uh, functoriality in, in algebraic topology is, is sort of to relate these algebraic invariants and therefore to relate information about the space. Um, very recently, last 20 years, right, we've been doing this sort of applied alge algebraic topology game. And, and the story there is a little bit different. Uh, what we want to do now is we want to, I have some real world system 
that I'm interested in. And who knows, you know, what it is exactly. But I'm going to hook up a bunch of sensors to that system. Uh, and I'm going to have sort of a, a what I'll call a sensor space. Um, but we'll just say it's metric. Uh, it's probably, if, if, if you're, you know, 99.99% uh, .99 of the time, what I'm looking at here is a copy of RD for some large dimensional, right? Some, some, some high dimensional Euclidean space where I've got one dimension for every sensor and I'm recording a number out of every sensor. And then my measurements are just points in sensor space, right? So, so every measurement I make of the system is a different point in my sensor space. And my hope is that I've hooked up enough different sensors that whatever the salient structure is in the system has Im become embedded in the sensor space, right? In the sense that there's a faithful representation of that structure as geometry in sensor space. So now what I'd like to do is go and get all of my favorite tools from algebraic topology and attach them to the sensor data and say something about the shape of this embedded object and therefore infer something about the system that I started with, right? That's, that's the whole game that I think I should be able to play. Um, unfortunately, what I have, if I have real data is a finite number of samples uh, and everything I was just talking about was these nice continuous geometric objects. Um, but if you give me a, you know, a bunch of samples in a high dimensional space, they look like points. I can try to wire these up uh, to create a simplicial complex. And, and sort of the standard thing you do is the so-called Vitoris Rips complex. Uh, which is, so if I have a point cloud X, this is VR of X. Um, the idea here is that I'll choose some uh, scale parameter epsilon, and I'll just say if points are within, if a fam, oop. Okay, great, thanks, David. So you guys have seen seen via source complexes. I'll go very. Uh, can I go fast? Okay. I just uh, so the, the the important part is right that I just want to um, point out that okay. So so the Vitor source complex. What does it do? It, uh, it 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 um it fills in if 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 all a bunch of points live in an epsilon ball, then it's going to fill in a simplex uh, supported on those points. That's that's its goal. And there are various theoretical results that say if I take points sampled on a topological space embedded in my sensor space, then I recover, you know, at scale epsilon, I recover some version of the, the topology. Um, and then if I let epsilon vary, then I get this increasing family of complexes, each of which records the structure at a different scale. And our hope, our deep hope, is that there will be a... Uh, um, there will be a, a reflection of the structure of the system somewhere in all of that. Okay, uh, I take these complexes, I play the same game, but now if you've got a triangulation of an object, I play the same game I played before, apply homology, and I get this sequence of homology um, groups. So uh, where each one maps to the next as I increase the scale parameter. Um, and this is just functoriality at play, right? Each one of these things, in includes in the next biggest one. So I can just apply my functoriality, I get this whole thing. Um, and so what I end up with is something like what we call persistent homology at level K of the Viator Schrips complex. And now uh, I'm just wrapping all of these things up into one object. Okay, so that, that, that dot there means I'm, I'm allowing the scale parameter to vary and I'm taking this, the P's, I'm taking the whole sequence of groups. Um, so it turns out there's a structure theorem for these things, so we can understand their isomorphism classes. Um, so there's this thing called the persistence diagram, which is a collection of points in the upper half plane. And I won't try to explain in the limited time we have exactly how this deal works, but, but the idea is that you'll get a whole bunch of points living sort of above this. Um, so this is the birth and death axis. This tells you when cycles are born and when they die as you sort of move through the, this sequence of, of, of complexes. And this is the line beta equals delta. Everything has to be born before it can die. So everything lives up there. Um, so it turns out that these diagrams index 
isomorphism types of these algebraic gadgets. So if I give you two different point clouds and you push them through this whole process and they come out the other side, I can ask the question, are they isomorphic? Which was the thing I asked way back in the day when I was an early 20th century algebraic topologist. But now, now we're censoring and there's noise and so many other things can go wrong. I might be sampling this, you know, the system in slightly different states. So I don't actually want alignment here. I don't want isomorphism. I need a notion of metric. So what we do is we put a, a metric on the space of persistence diagrams and we check to see if they're close. So, so now we've moved to a place where, right? I, I, and really, what I should say is, if I were a very, very good uh, scientist and, and, and philosopher, I would think about these things as probability distributions. And I would study them entirely through that perspective, because way back at the beginning, my samples were all probabilistic, right? So everything inside here should be probabilistic. This is not an easy problem. We're working very hard to get the math involved. But we don't know how to do probabilistic algebra very well yet uh, in this context. We're just, there's a lot of people who have different pieces of this elephant. Um, but... Uh, think of it just as, a, as an explicit sample, I can compute distances and say, ah, the distance is small, therefore these things are probably potentially similar, right? They're just like they're potentially, just like they're isomorphic, therefore they potentially came from the same space. So that's the game up to now in algebraic or in applied algebraic topology, right? I want to study a system, so I compute this whole sequence of events, and now I say, okay, I've got these various things in my persistence diagram, which represent various things in the isomorphism type of my persistent homology. Uh, what can I infer in an ad hoc way about the original system? And to do that, usually what I do is I go and I find a domain scientist and I wave my arms really hard about the combinatorics of viator strips complexes and they frown at me a lot, and then we try to interpret what a cycle should mean under all of the various equivalence classes and everything else. And, um, you know, very, very coarse inferences are made because we don't have the ability to ask uh, specific questions. Oh, and there's a question here, why persistence? Uh, and the, the, the idea here is that um, you're going to ask how, so, so cycles are at, at different scale parameters. I'll have sort of, you know, a cycle will form at some scale parameter. Um, and then eventually, I'm going to add in enough, or I'll get I'll get a big enough scale parameter that I'll connect these guys up and these guys up. And once I've done that, then I'm going to do my best to fill everything in, and I'll kill off that hole. So we say that um, if it takes a long time for something between its birth and its death, we say it persists for a long time. And so we call it the persistent homology, because we're interested in Classically, people were very interested specifically in the long persistence cycles. Uh, yeah, exactly. And those points are far from the line in the persistence diagram. So this guy up here is a highly persistent because his birth is way before death. This guy down here is um, not. So, yeah, great. Thanks for thanks for the question. So, um, right. Yeah. So 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 we've gotten as far as early twentieth century topology and uh, studying isomorphism types. And now we want to uh, now we want to sort of lean into using this stuff. Well, what the scientists usually ask me is, "Hey, Chad, how do I identify the thing in my system that I care about as part of all of this mathematical mumbo jumbo going on down here? How do I point into the persistence diagram and say this point represents this stuff?" And I say, "Oh, well, you know, the thing I want to do is go and take off the shelf functoriality because that's how I would have done it if I was an algebraic topologist." Um, oh, right. Um, so I just very briefly want to tell you about my particular choice of application, uh, which is neuroscience. Um, and one thing that we're very interested in neuroscience, and that is that I imagine that I have some brain region. So I just have, I have two brain regions. So this is, you know, region one and region two. And I'm going to imagine that there's strong forward connectivity between region one and region two. In other words, I would expect information in the brain to flow from one of these regions to the other one. Um, 
So using the framework I've just described to you, I can record neurons in the brain. Well, not me. I, I've tried this. I've been in the lab and I'm not very good at it, but people who are good at it can go to the lab, record neurons in the brain and uh, extract vast, vast numbers of time series, which we can then encode as simplicial complexes. Um, and it turns out that due to some classical theory and algebraic topology, uh, we can actually show that if there is geometric structure encoded in the information that the brain is representing, we can get it back through this structure, this process. Um, and so, for example, my head, you, you know, you, somewhere in your brain, there are neurons that record your head direction, what direction you're facing. And you can tell this because you can close, you know, you all played pin and tail on the donkey. And if I only spin you around once and you, you, you know, with your eyes closed, you can get, a, you got a pretty good idea what direction you're facing. I have to spin you around a bunch to confuse you. So, so the brain is recording that information. So somewhere in there, there's a circular coordinate system. And it turns out there are very many. Um, so one natural reason you might, what, one natural question you might have is, say I find circular coordinates here, and I know down here, there's circular coordinates here. Um, are those the same circular coordinates? This information, geometric information being passed on, or is it just, you know, a coincidence or something else being represented in that brain region? Right, maybe it's new and newly discovered geometry. Who knows? Uh, so we want to be able to answer this question, and in order to do it, I need to be able to tell you: is this circle the same as that circle in some formal way? So this is my, you know, the, the reason that I ended up here um, specifically. Um, okay, so um, I just want to very briefly tell you um, about sort of the history of trying to answer this question. Um, so the very first place that this would have appeared was in uh, work about 2012 by Bauer and Lesnick. Um, and they were just, they just asked the following question. So suppose that these are samples from a space, you know, so I, I really have sampled from X and I've sampled from Y and I have a function. I own a continuous function on the underlying sampled spaces. Then I could ask the question, you know, is there a way to use functoriality in the original way that we would back in the algebraic standard algebraic topology world to match up these cycles? Um, and they said, yes. I mean, there's just sort of a naive homological algebra way. Um, but unfortunately, if you just follow your nose and use the sort of methods of tra traditional algebraic topology, um, the only dots that can match for X and Y are ones with the same death time. So, so they would have to have identical Y coordinates. Uh, and this is just a result of algebraic theorems that we have no control over. Basically, if I want to use the data of a continuous map on the underlying spaces that I'm sampling from to get a match between, to get like a formal algebraic match between these two things, Right, I can only match this this dark cycle to this light cycle if they have the same depth, which is not satisfying because if I have some noise, these, they're just going to wiggle and I'm going to lose that match and everything is lost. Further, it's not satisfying because if I don't know what my topological space X is, I don't know what my topological space Y is. In what universe would I ever have a map? Right, so so it's it's really. This is asking too much. They needed it for something very different than what I'm using it for. They were they were trying to understand the structure of of persistence modules and 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 really understand algebraic or the the sort of the underlying algebraic topology of the thing. But, but this is sort of the state of the art for quite a while. Um, so uh, more recently, and by more recently, I mean published in 2022. Um, there's this uh, work by Riani and uh, Bobrovsky, uh, uh, and I apologize to Omer, I always butcher his last name, um, where uh, they were interested in sort of, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, the theorem paper. So this is uh, Bauer and Lesnick's paper. Um, well, that's good enough. I, okay. I was just wondering if, you, if, you, if that paper sh says that the death time has to be the same. Uh, it should be in there, or if it's not, it is in one of the immediate follow-ups to that paper. I, 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 I can find the reference and send it to you. No problem. 
yeah but roughly it's just because of uh the structure of maps between modules like it's, it's it comes down to the very basic algebraic you know if this is the module morphism then um so um right so then uh this much more recent paper um they're they're interested in studying the idea that i have a very large point cloud and i'm gonna take some subsamples and what I want to know is, you know, how well do I do at sort of reconstructing the original data, which is which is also very nice uh, question. And so what they do is they say, okay, I have you know some subsamples x1 and x2 living in my big X. Um, I compute the persistent homology of these things, and then I want to know, you know, what's the persistent homology of this? Or maybe, you know, do I see the same cycles across x1 and x2? Are these really the same? Um, and so what they what they do is they construct this little collection um, x1, x1 union x2, and x2, because these are the three things I actually have my hands on. Um, and there are obviously inclusion maps like this. Uh, this gives us uh, what's called a zigzag in the applied topology world and in the general algebraic topology world. Um, so it turns out that I can take a cycle here, sigma, and I can ask you know, is there something over here, tau, which maps up to where sigma went? So basically, I can I, I have a, a sensible way to ask the question: Are these two things the same? Do sigma and tau match map to the same spot upstairs? Um, and this works out fairly well if I have strong geometric structure, and what I'm interested in is sort of confirming that it exists in subsamples. Um, however. It has two major weaknesses from my perspective. One is that I, there has to be sort of an ambient space. There has to be this X that things are coming from. Uh, and that's a problem because in, in my favorite example, I you know, there's not an ambient, I mean, there's a sort of a union of the neurons, but it's not really a sensible thing to do uh, because the ambient space should have sort of a coherent metric on it, right? Because I want to compare in this the X1 union X2, in order to really build my Viator strips complex, I need a metric that is coherent between the two sides. Um, and asking that there is a coherent metric is is a big ask. Um, if if I don't know that two things came from the same system. Um, so so right, so that's that's a problem. And um and the other problem is I'm not really sure uh sort of how to generalize. This object. If I have, if I want to think about things that are are sort of maps and things like that, now right again, I just have to have. I sort of have one object, and I'm studying internal to it. You can get away with this in a lot of settings, but but in a lot of applied settings, it's fairly clear that I should think about things as being sort of not attached to one another. So, okay, so this is this is very cool. It works very well. Let's you. Uh, sort of analyze subsamples, which is a big problem for us because our computations are very slow. Um, and in particular, compare them to see that you have robustness, which is which is great. Um, okay. Um, but like my test space doesn't fit into this setting in any any anywhere, right? So, so here's my wish list. Here's here's things I want. I want to I want to use only information I can observe about the system from the outside. Uh, right, so I'm sampling things from the system, and I, you know, probably I'm, if I'm now comparing things, I'm sampling things from two different systems. So I need to be able to use that sample information to construct whatever it is that I'm going to do. I don't have the underlying spaces, so I don't have functions. And if I'm thinking about, you know, my personal hobby horse question, then, you know, I want to know, uh, uh, it's not even really clear that a function should exist. Right, so let's say that I'm observe my test thing is in the outside world. It's what direction are you facing, right? But I'm recording a bunch of things in the outside world, so I'm not really sure what your brain is representing. Uh, so only some of those are going to affect my internal state, and my internal state is only going to be in, is going to represent a lot of things that aren't in any way affected by the outside world. So in that case, what I really have is a relation. not a function, right? There, are some, there should be some things which I can vary in both places which don't affect the answer um, in any way. So so I need, I, I, and, and it turns out though that relations are something that we use in science all the time. 
correlations are relations, right? And it's right there in the name. Uh, it's just a rectangular matrix. Here are the things in, in space A, here are the things in space B, and here's a dissimilarity between them. And we can turn that into a metric if we like, but we don't need to. I want it to be robust to noise and resampling, um, right? And that's that's a major problem for all uh, of these uh, sorts of very formal algebraic objects, because if I tweak the endpoints, I don't want it to break. Um, and the num number three, I, I want it to be composable. I, I really want this thing to be a functor um, under this notion. And that's going to argue a lot with <laughs> the previous thing, uh, right? I really am going to at some point going to have to include the probabilistic perspective. I don't know how to do that, but it's uh, uh, right there. Um, so, so I really want, you know, at some point, I'm going to want some kind of low level structure that lets me do these things. So, um, very briefly, let me just tell you that. Um, the, the way that we've approached this problem is to switch from Viator strips complexes to something called witness complexes. So here I have two distinct uh, two distinct populations. So X and Y are both subsets of the same metric space. Um, and so I have sort of uh, my dark points, which are witnesses, these are X, and my white points, which are the points I'm interested in. Thank you. And um, and I'm just going to, instead of taking distance from one point to all the other points, I'm only going to think about points that are within an epsilon radius. That's my circle. Uh, epsilon radius of points in X. And I'm going to, so, so this would be a, a triangle because all those points lie in this epsilon ball. So this is witness epsilon uh, points in Y witnessed by points in X. Okay. So it's a slightly different construction. It turns out that they're related, but this isn't the one people normally use. So what we want to do is relate, but 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 this thing has a very nice formal property, um, and that is something uh, called uh, Dowker's theorem, which is from the 1950s. It's this very beautiful paper, um, homology of relations, uh, where he was studying relations between sets, um, and what he ends up proving functionally is this, that the homology of the witness complex at scale epsilon between x and y is the same as the homology, the witness complex at scale epsilon y to x. And that is just a fantastic theorem. This tells you that from this topological perspective, being observed and observing are kind of the same thing. Uh, which tells you there's certain things we are never, ever going to see. <laughs> but it also tells you that you can play this game where I take sort of the a, a bunch of triangles supported on points in X and turn them into triangles supported on points in Y. So if I have two populations and a way to get into this witness complex, I'm in business because I can bounce you from one population to another. Um, the data of a witness complex is how far are points in X from points in Y. That's a relation. So this uses the data we want, and it gives us a way to jump back and forth. So this is the foundation of our, our, our of the method that we ended up proposing. Um, and then we did, you know, 50 pages of highly messy mathematics to, to, to line it all up and make it work. Um, but let me just briefly skip to, um, I want to... Uh, tell you uh, sort of the story in two minutes. So we start with the viator strips complex, the thing that people normally use in data. We do this method called cycle extension, um, which uh, is, I really need to credit um, Iris Yoon for cycle extension because um, I struggled with it for a long time and she came along and was like, oh, I just do that. Um, and uh, it basically has to do with intersections of subspaces and vector spaces. It's a very pretty um, tool, but it lets you move from the VHR strips complex to the witness complex at the per, at the cost of being a multi-valued map. So you take a cycle and you get a family of cycles that might represent it um, in the witness complex. You apply Dowker's theorem. Now you're somewhere else. You're in in and in, in, in the witness complex is built on the relation. So I'm using the data of the relation to jump over to the other complex. And now I'll just run this run the process backwards and do this extension process again. I'll get an even bigger. Um, 
So, so you give me a cycle and I'll give you back an affine subspace of the other homology group consisting of things that might represent it. And this is a complete list of anything that sensibly could represent your cycle. So now if I have a circle, I can drop it into my test system. I can say, okay, this circle definitely represents head direction. I tracked it in the real world. Where did it land in your brain? Um, and uh, two directions, cycle extension adjoints. Or the, as far as we know, no, there. So let me say the following thing. The problem is really this Viatoris Rips guy. Um, so he 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 shows up, and we don't really know how Viatoris Rips and witness complexes are are related. So there's no there's a sort of there should be a formal relationship between the Viatoris Rips complex and the witness complex from X to itself that is easy to exploit. Um, however, there isn't. I believe that, uh, oh, sorry, one other uh, one other addition before I say that. What we want to do is replace this with that, and, and that'll make this thing coherent in the sense that we'll be applying the same functors everywhere. Um, and then we can start to ask these questions. But cycle extension, there's one other problem with cycle extension as it currently stands. And that is the way that it's written down, there is a choice. And so it is not functorial. Um, and the choice, we, we have sort of a, we have a semi-canonical choice in the sense that we believe it's canonical, but we, we have no way of actually showing that the other choices sort of don't work. Um, so I think in that case, we might be able to make a statement about, um, uh, uh, you know, what, What's going on here? But but the functionally, we know this. We know this method works because we can write down the topology to make it go. We don't understand how it should work in the sense that this is clearly not the right language for it. Which is one reason I think that you folks might find it very interesting because you know what we really want to do is take this data of the relation and turn it into a morphism in a sensible way. Um, and you know, I hope. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, and, and I think I think you have to move to a probabilistic world in order to do that. Number one, but uh, number two, I think uh, we have to clear up a lot of these technical issues with you know what is the actual right construction to be using, and how do we square that with what people do in practice, or do we just throw away what's done in practice now and move to something which is formally correct? So, um, Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So the answer is uh, there's no particularly good reason not to. Um, they are not the same complex in the sense that uh, they're, so they're, they're, they're what's called interleaved. And so there's a control on how far apart they are in the metric that you put on um, sort of the. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, YouTube audience would like to know the questions. That's a great point. Uh, so why not use uh, the witness complex of X with itself instead of the Viator Strips complex on X? And it, it's a, the you know primary answer is because everybody uses the Viator Strips complex. And if you show up and say, well, I've got a better reason or a better tool, then I better come, you know, well armed. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and, you know, th I think the, this is a compelling place. If, once, if we get all everything ironed out, I think there's a, this is a very compelling argument for using it. Um, but the other answer is that, um, you know, we, we know it's related to the thing everybody uses, but there's not really a tight, there, there aren't really, you know, I guess I can say a little bit about how they're related in the sense that I can tell you bounds on how badly they're different. Um, but, you know, if you say, oh, this cycle appears here, could you say anything at all about whether it appears there at this particular parameter? I would, uh, you know, I would fumble because I don't think the geom, anybody's even really sat down to think about the geometry of how these two things are related. So, and at the end of the day, um, you know, being able to, I can answer questions about what Viator Schrift's complex actually sees because it's very natural, right? This sees that if they're close. Witness complex, this sees that triangle if these things are collectively close to it, um, which is just a little, just a touch harder to interpret and therefore it can be um, difficult for uh, applications where we're trying to sell all of this advanced algebraic machinery to people.
Um, hey, Chad. Uh, I, I guess you finished the body of your talk, right? We, we kind of yeah. slid into yeah. question time. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, would, would you mind making uh, a little more concrete in your intended application what uh, X and Y are? And uh, I don't know, maybe it's too much to hope to explain anything about how you do the cycle extension, but but at least kind of what X and Y are and how they're living in the same metric space. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so they aren't living in the same metric space, which is the reason that we need this whole mess. So if they're living in the same metric space, I just rely on the cycle registration method. Um, rather, what we have are, um, and I'll get to the uh, chat question in just a moment, but uh, uh, what we have are uh, sort of internal correlations between elements in each distinct neural population. And then we have a, a notion of cross-correlation between elements in the distinct neural populations. And this is, you know, the, because there's a time delay of transmission of information, it really would be inappropriate to use the same metric for the internal and the external. So, so they definitely don't live sort of in the same metric space. Uh, rather, um, so, so what we want to do is we want to take... Uh, sort of the populate, neural population activity in region X, neural population activity in region Y. I want to construct, um, so I, I construct uh, uh, an internal dissimilarity matrix for the activity patterns, right? And this is sort of something like the correlation distance. Um, it's not, but it's, it's similar, right? So now I've got, now I really do have the data of viator strips complex internal to the region. And then the, the nerve theorem from algebraic topology plus a lot of hand-waving tells you that, you know, whatever topological structure was encoded in the, it should be encoded there. Um, so again, if I've got a, you know, circle represented, um, lots of visual areas represent lots of circles. So there's, there's, there's plenty of questions here about how those things are transformed as we move through the brain. And then, you know, the Y will also be the internal neural population activity for a second uh, second brain region. And uh, and then, right, and then the witness complex is built out of the cross-correlation measure. And so that's where we get this sort of um, additional information. Um, as far as how the cycle extension method is working, it's actually very simple. It's just technically hard to write down. Um, essentially what you do is uh, there's a little zigzag, um, where I fix, I choose, I choose a, the cycle I'm interested in. And I look at sort of the last moment before it dies when it's the equivalence class is as big as possible. So it's got as many possible representatives as it can. Um, and that's the semi-canonical choice. Um, and now I'm going to ask in the sort of, um, in the intersection so I've got the Viator strips complex and the witness complex are both sitting on the vertices X. So I could take the intersection of those two complexes and I can ask which ones of those contain representatives of my big equivalence class. Those are all potentially places where my, my, my homology class landed when I jumped over into the witness complex because they're supported on the same vertices. There's actual geometry I can exploit here. So I'm really just asking a question, does this, does this cycle that I'm interested in intersect any cycles in the witness complex? And if so, I'll call those potentially things. Um, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the ending words of your talk. So I, uh, thanks for the talk, Chad. Oh, yeah. um, we'll just officially thank you. And, um, and yeah, it looks like we have a question from Valeria and yeah. anyone who else who has uh, questions can feel free to unmute or raise your hand. Um, yeah, maybe Valeria's question. Yeah, happy to, happy to answer Valeria's question. Yeah, and, and thank you all also for inviting me and for, for listening. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I it sort of, we did kind of slide into questions uh, sort of unceremoniously. Uh, there was no good, please ask questions slide for me to hang my hat on here. So yeah, Valeria, uh, let's see. So Valeria asks, can you repeat the intuition of the relation of the Vietro strips in the witness complex? And then also you said something about multi-valued functions that was Iris Yoon's uh, contribution. And yeah, so um, the multi-valued functions are what I just uh, just described, this notion that you say, okay, what are all of the places in the witness complex that the Viator strips complex sort of, it, the, the cycle in the Viator strips complex intersects? So there's very, very many of them. 
uh, potentially. So it's a multi-valued function. So so those upward and downward arrows there with the the uh, multiple lines are are meant to indicate multi-valued maps. Um, as far as uh, the relation of the Viator strips and the witness complex, um, so the intuition there. Let me just quickly draw a little picture. Um, so you know, if I have, um, so if I have a Viator strips complex, um, you know, these things, these three points are close together. So they'll quick, you know, at scale epsilon, uh, they'll they'll I they'll all. Um, uh, uh, merge up and and become a uh, uh, a simplex. Um, so I'm gonna have to think about the the non-example here for a second. Um, roughly, okay. Roughly, the point is that um, being a family of ah, this is what it is. So if I have sort of this big distributed thing where no, oh, it's like we're at it. Sorry, this is one of those things that uh, I, I, you know, I should know off, uh, deep, deep down in my soul. Uh, I've thought about it so much, but somehow the actual example escapes me. Roughly, the the the, the Viator strips complex says a collection of simple a collection of points forms a simplex if they're all epsilon close. The witness complex of points to of a point cloud to itself says a collection of points forms a simplex if they are all epsilon close to some point in the uh, uh, in, in the set. And and this is there's a very subtle difference there, and it just it requires like a sort of a pathological example. But these pathological examples show up all over the place in the um, when you actually try to draw them, um, it's just, of course, when you try to construct them that they're hard. Um, so, so, and this is part of the reason why people don't really understand what the difference is because one of them is is just slightly harder to say. <laughs> so, Chad, can you say what um, the functoriality of the witness complex is with respect to x and y? Uh, uh, with respect to x and y, yeah. Uh, hang on just a second, Dave. Let me. Uh, yeah. So, I'm just going to answer this other question by Evan because. Yeah, if I add a point here uh, to the center of the hexagon, get a witness, but not the VR. Uh, so the question is, if I had a point in the center of the hexagon, can I get uh, uh, something that's in the witness complex, but not the VR complex? And yeah, I think because we have to design this shape in such a ah, yeah, okay, right. This is how you do it. You you design a bunch of points that are close together, and then you've got some points that are sort of spread out in some sort of, you've got the witnesses spread out in a way which causes, there's, I, I think Evan, you're probably right, but I'm really bad at trigonometry in my head. And so I'm probably going to make a mistake. Um, so yeah, you, it's, 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 it's the gap between distances between things that fit in a ball and the ball itself. Um, so, and okay, so, uh, and I apologize. I'm, I'm, I, the more I think about it, the worse I'm going to get at this. Uh, David, so David, your question was that you want to know about the functoriality of the witness complex with respect to X and Y, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, right. So if I have a map, so I have to be, uh, so I have to be a little bit careful what I mean by X and Y. So, um, so let's see. So uh, if I give you, um, Right. So, so usually the witness complex as we use it is a finite subset of some metric space. And just for, you know, the sake of argument, we'll call it RN. Um, and I need to know what, right. I'm going to need some kind of map to Y, which is going to be a subspace of say RM. Well, if they're going to, sorry. Yeah, that'll be fine. Nope. That's not going to be fine because they're going to both need to be witnessing witnessed by the same point cloud, so they're going to have to be members of the same ambient space. Um, so this map is going to have to be sort of a set map, but it's I, I want it to be something that looks like an inclusion of x into x prime and y into y prime. Yeah, exactly. So so exact something that looks like an isometry um, will probably give you something functorial. Um, if it's not an isometry, then you're probably not going to get functoriality directly. Um, we don't use anything um, 
in, in this construction, we sort of, the only place that we map onto a different point set is actually, oh, I guess, so, so so the place that we would be interested in it would be the witness XX mapping to the witness uh, YX, right? That's that's sort of our um, our position of interest. But your title was um, a useful category. What what category were you talking about? Oh, so so we would like to construct morphisms. Ah, oh, you want one, right? We don't have one. Okay, that's why. That's why we're towards it. <laughs> I said toward. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, I know. There's, there's no category here. It's it's a it's the problem I, is that the the existing category, the one that was laid out in Bauer and Lesnick, doesn't work for anything in applications, um, because we just don't have a good notion of morphism that we can build, um, out of the data that we have available. So so we want to leverage. Yeah, we want to leverage relation the sort of leverage observable data, which is to say the data of relations to construct a notion of morphism, which actually composes. And one major problem with that um, that I should add is that even if we get all of this working in a nice functorial way, which I think is plausible given, given the setup, if we switch away from the Viator strips complex, um, the next question is going to be, how do you compose those relations? And um, it weighted, you know, so an unweighted relation is is, is exactly a bipartite graph. Um, and that's easy, right? Composing bipartite graphs, we all know how to do it. Um, but the problem is that the um, these are weighted relations and the composition is actually happening at the level of the topology where um, it's no longer clear that the bipartite graph um, composition gives you a nice map on homology. So so there there are sort of like there, there are going to have to be conditions on the relations to make everything work. That's that's certainly true, but we also simply don't know how to make composition work um, in, in this setting. So well um thanks again Chad for making it work today despite the laptop snafu yeah. and uh, thanks again yeah. and we'll, we'll stop the recording. Um, and uh, sometimes people stick around a little longer um, yeah. for questions, but I mean, it, it's up to you.